it gets answered. One request I have, before we complete the evening, please hang on for a rundown of additional programs we will be sponsoring in the coming months, and I promise it will not be lengthy. I'll just uh, do it as quickly as possible. At this point, let me turn the program over to Brandy, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Anton. Uh, well, it is my pleasure to introduce your speaker tonight, Dr. Gleb. Uh, Dr. Gleb was lauded as the office whisperer and the hybrid expert by New York Times for helping leaders use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. He serves as the CEO of the future of work consulting firm, Disaster Avoidance Expert. Dr. Gleb wrote seven best-selling books, including Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. He published over 650 articles in prominent venues such as the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and Fortune. His cutting-edge thought leadership has translated into Chinese, German, Russian, Korean, Polish, Spanish, Vietnamese, French, and other languages. Dr. Gleb's experience comes from over 20 years of consulting and training. His clients include Fortune 500 companies ranging from Affleck to Xerox. His expertise also comes from his academic background as a behavior scientist. Dr. Gleb taught for eight years as a lecturer at UNC Chapel Hill and seven years as a professor at Ohio State. Dr. Gleb is a proud Ukrainian American and lives in Columbus, Ohio. In his free time, he spends an abundant quality, uh, an abundance of quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. To help you take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, B. Lira and the CWP have asked him to share with us about using hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. Now, please give a warm welcome for Dr. Gleb. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Brandy, and thank you everyone for coming. So let's talk about hybrid work and how you can use that to, as Brandy mentioned, improve retention and productivity while also cutting costs. So here's the shape of the presentation. We'll talk about how we think about hybrid work and the way that we make decisions around hybrid work. The first part of this presentation will just be a brief framing of the question. How do we actually approach thinking and making decisions around hybrid work? Then we will move on to some data, some research on hybrid work, some statistics. Then we'll move on to the kind of mistakes that leaders tend to make and HR folks tend to make when they approach hybrid work. And we'll finish up with some best practices when you use hybrid work that will actually help you improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. So that's what the shape of the presentation. That's what you can anticipate. Throughout the presentation, we'll be using polling. So make sure to keep an eye out for polls. I'll announce them. But yeah, you'll be able to engage with polls and so that we can see where everybody is at. Now, let's start with a decision and framing your decision. So let's say after this presentation, you want to get a late evening snack and you open your fridge and you see that there are two choices of ice cream. One that contains 10% fat and another one that's 90% fat free. So one that's 10% fat or one that's 90% fat free. Which of these would you choose? So please go ahead and vote. Which of these would you choose? Ice cream that's 90% fat free? or 10% fat. Five more seconds. Okay, so we see that there's a very clear choice here. The large majority of folks here, about two thirds would prefer 10% fat. One third would prefer 90% fat free. Now, when we think about this, there's very clear preference, but thinking about the numbers here, 10% fat means it's 90% fat free, right? 
And 90% fat free means it's 10% fat. It's the same thing. There's no difference between 90% fat free and 10% fat. But for some reason, clearly, two thirds of us have a strong preference for 10% fat. And that is about the way that we frame information and the way that it's framed for us. It's called the framing effect. So how the information is framed, just a description of the same information, can really change our thoughts and our decisions about the issue at hand. So I want you to think about what's your framing around hybrid work? What's, your, what's the leadership's framing at hybrid work and organizations where you work? How do they think about hybrid work? This is critical because I very much often think about when I see leaders working with high, thinking about hybrid work, they see it as a loss. So I've helped over two dozen companies figure out their transition to hybrid work, over two dozen companies. And inevitably, when I come in to work with a company, I see its leadership really seeing this hybrid work as a problem, remote work as a problem. And I really encourage them to think of it as a disruption because it's a major opportunity to seize. So thinking of this disruption associated with hybrid work, with remote work, as a major opportunity that they can seize, not a problem that they need to solve. So don't think of it as a problem to solve, but as an opportunity to seize. So frame hybrid work as a major opportunity to improve productivity and retention while cutting costs. That's what allows smart and savvy leaders to seize competitive advantage in the future of work. Now to do so, we really need to watch out because it's very tempting and intuitive to go with what's comfortable to us, what feels right. But we need to watch out for putting that personal comfort ahead of what our business objectives actually are. So putting aside our default assumptions, habits, and preferences is very important. Focusing on business objectives and outcomes rather than what might feel personally comfortable. To do so, we need to overcome cognitive biases, these decision-making errors in the future of work, and integrate some best practices. And so that's the framing I want to introduce. And that's the framing I encourage you to be thinking about and to be communicating to other folks around hybrid work after you check out this presentation. Okay, let's move on to some of the research. So I want to share the results of eight major independent surveys from organizations like the Harvard Business School, Stanford University, Society for Human Resource Management, Gallup, and so on, McKinsey, organizations that don't have any particular stake in the outcome, one way or the other. What they found overwhelmingly is that the large majority of workers who are remote capable, who can do their work remotely, don't want traditional office-centric work, meaning Monday through Friday, nine to five. 25 to 35% actually want full-time remote work. So for example, LinkedIn found that about something like 13, 14% of all of their ads on LinkedIn job ads are for full-time remote work. But those ads get over 50% of the interest, over 50% of the interest is like 13, 14% of the job ads. And that shows you how many people want full-time remote work. There's a strong desire for it. But of course, 25 to 35% want full-time remote work, something like 15 to 25% want traditional office-centric work. That means that the large majority, something like 50 to 60%, want hybrid work, want to work from home more than half the work week which is generally what hybrid work refers to. 40 to 55% would leave their job if forced to come in full time. Over 70% are less likely to leave if they're offered substantial remote work. So clearly this, the ability to work substantial amount of time remotely over half the work week, that's generally the definition of substantial amount of time, is a huge retention and recruitment boost. It's major, we very clearly see that. And we also know that remote employees are more productive when they work remotely if they are in a hybrid modality. So we're talking here employees who are spending over half their work week working from home. Over 55% report higher productivity, 15% report lower productivity, the rest 
30% report equal productivity. So that's on self-reports. What about other metrics? So employee monitoring software found that remote staff, when their people are working remotely, they're 5% more productive on average. And we also know that there was a Stanford University study that found that in May 2020, people who are working remotely were on average 5% more productive. By May 2022, they grew to be 9% more productive. Why? Why this increase in productivity over this period of time? Well, in May 2020, we barely knew how to work together remotely. It was just after the shutdowns. By May 2022, companies made a lot of investments into technology that allowed better collaboration. Leaders, team managers learned how to work together and communicate better in the remote settings. The workers set up their home offices better. So there were a lot of factors. The utilities invested into faster than internet. There were a lot of factors that improved productivity at that time for people who are working remotely. And it's understandable why people working remotely are more productive because they don't have to do the commute. People are willing to spend about 40% of the time that they would have spent commuting, which is quite a drag. It's an hour there, an hour back for many people, more for some people if they're in a large urban area. They are willing to spend about 40% of their time doing work. They're also more able to focus because they're not distracted by others around them. And they can also align their work more with their own chronotype, meaning when they are freshest and when they have the most energy. So the flexibility of hours can be just as important as the flexibility of location. Remote and hybrid employees have better well-being. Over 75% of those who spend more than half the work week working from home feel less stressed. Over 70% report better well-being over 75% report feeling happier. And now I want to ask you, we'll, do, we'll be doing another poll. Which of these is your preferred working style? Is it fully remote? Is it one day a week from the office, two days a week in the office, three days in the office, four days in the office, or full-time five days a week in the office? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, all of us participated, that's great. So we see that we have the largest numbers for the plurality, no, not even the plurality, the majority want to work in a hybrid schedule. So we have over 60% want to work in a hybrid schedule, one day, two days, or three days a week in the office. Then we have, just as the statistics suggest, we have 30% who want to work fully remote, and we have a little bit lower on in this group than the typical group who want 8% who want to work full-time in the office, which is not surprising being this is the virtual chapter of the association. <laughs> now, so that's the statistics. So that's the information about the averages, but let's talk a little bit about the kind of decision-making errors that leaders make when they think about hybrid work and employees as well. One of the biggest challenges I see is the status quo bias. Now, cognitive biases are decision-making errors. That's kind of my wheelhouse, cognitive uh, behavioral science, cognitive biases, my area of expertise. And status quo bias is one of the many cognitive biases that we experience because of how our mind is wired. And the thing is, our mind is not wired for the modern environment. It's wired for the savannah environment. When we lived in small tribes, of 50 people to 150 people. In that environment, if the situation changed, it was not a good sign because our environment was very precarious, it was very important for us to survive. And so the major changes were just changes of the season, spring, summer, fall, winter. And if there was a change in our surroundings, that was a bad sign. And so it was, we have a strong drive to fix anything that changes. We have anxiety about things that go, that take us away from the status quo that we are used to, and that we prefer, and that we like. And so that's a real problem. It's called the status quo bias. It's a desire to maintain or get back to the status quo, including downplaying major disruptions, such as from the pandemic. 
our world right now is much more disrupted than it was when we lived in the savanna environment. We have the rise of generative AI. We have the rise, obviously, of the pandemic. We have we had the rise of smartphones. We had the 2008, 2009 fiscal crisis. All of these disrupt us, but very often it's hard for us to recognize the impacts of this disruption. How we can't, for example, go back to working like we did in January 2020, even though many leaders want to do so. Another cognitive bias is called the empathy gap. The empathy gap. So empathy has to do with understanding and appreciating other people's emotions. And the empathy gap is underestimating the importance of emotions and other people's decisions, like the people's desires for flexibility and well-being after the pandemic. In the Savannah environment, it was important for us to empathize only with members of our own tribe and with people who didn't share our perspectives. It was not so important for us to empathize with them. In that environment, in the current environment, many leaders perceive those who are not fellow leaders, they don't really empathize with their staff who want the flexibility and well-being after the pandemic. And that's a big problem. Lack of empathy causes bad decision making. And the final one is functional fixedness that I want to share about. Functional fixedness. It's kind of like the hammer nail syndrome. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, when you learn one way of functioning, of collaborating together, of bleeding people, then we tend to become stuck in that way of functioning. In this bad environment, that was quite functional for us because there weren't that many ways of creating stone tools or hunting or some or other things like that, creating cooking meals. There weren't that many ways of functioning. They, we, they didn't change over time. It was beneficial for us to learn something and just stick with it. In the modern environment, there are, as I mentioned, many more disruptions. So we need to learn new ways of doing things. That's very hard for us because we do tend to perceive only one right way of functioning and we have trouble learning new ways of doing things. So we tend to transpose office culture and hybrid work and remote work, and there's a failure to adapt strategically to the new reality that we face. And so I see that in many, very many leaders, employees as well. And so we'll be talking next about how do we adapt strategically to hybrid work. But before we do so, let's do another poll and see what one of these cognitive biases might be the most problematic for the future of work in your workplace. Please go ahead and vote. Uh, but Okay, five more seconds for the person who hasn't made their voice heard. Five more seconds. Okay, so we see that status quo bias is the majority. So 50% believe that that's the biggest problem, followed by closely by a third with functional fixedness and just over a six for the confirmation bias. Okay, good to know that, oh, that you know this is an opportunity for you to take this information and address it in your teams. Good. So let's talk about what are the actual best practices in making good decisions. So best practices for competitive advantages in the future of work is a team-led model. So a team-led model, including hybrid first for most people. So most people should be in a hybrid first modality. And that's really, and we'll talk about why, but most people function best when they do come to the office occasionally. So hybrid first with a minority fully remote, people who can effectively function in that manner and who are more an individual contributor. It's a little bit harder to be collaborators when you're fully remote, but it can certainly be done. So out of the over two dozen companies, 25 by now that I've helped, 23 of them chose to be hybrid first. They hired a few remote, fully remote folks. Two of the companies chose to be 
for, for the mold first. And so they, we managed to make things work, but it took more effort and time. So hybrid employees generally spend one to two days in the office, and that's the majority out of the companies of the leaders who I helped. And the fully remote employees are going to be a minority, 10 to 30%. Again, depends on the role and so on. And of course, you want to adopt best practices for hybrid and remote work arrangements. Now, you want to provide people with effective training on how to do hybrid work, what to do at home, what to focus on in the office, how to lead people in the at home and in the office. These are not intuitive things. Hybrid work is not neither fish nor fowl. Leaders don't know how to do it. And if they're not trained, they will make a lot of mistakes in this area. You want to train people on effective virtual communication and collaboration, both leaders and team members. Those are really important areas and people have not been trained nearly enough on how to do this effectively. Now, so that's kind of the general principle. The best practice is this team-led model where team leaders decide together with their team members on when to come to the office and how often. So that's a team-led model. It's much better than having a top-down model where a leader gives, says, come to the office on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, for example, because team members know what they need much better than team leaders. For example, think about accountants, right? So accountants, they are in a position of not needing to come to the office for most days. They can do their work fine from home, but they should probably come to the office at the end of the month to close the books for a couple of days, maybe at the end of the quarter for several days, at the end of the year for a couple of weeks, maybe in a row come to the office to work together to collaboratively close the books. That's for accountants. What about for, what about for someone like software engineers? Well, if they work in sprints, they might want to come in at the beginning of a sprint and then in two weeks again at the end of a sprint for a couple of days each. That's an example for software engineers. Or maybe if they have longer sprints, maybe if it's a month long, then come at the beginning and at the end. If you're working with salespeople, salespeople tend to want to come in more frequently because they're energized by each other. So they might come in two, three days, four days a week. You need to figure out on the team level. So the team level together need to decide and have buy-in into what they will be doing together. So that's a team led model, very effective approach. Now, as part of a team model, you want to think about how to help them collaborate effectively. So how do you solve collaboration and team building in a hybrid environment? A lot of leaders think that, well, I don't know how my people will collaborate effectively, so I'll just get them into the office so that they can collaborate. But there are many ways that you can get people to collaborate effectively if they are working remotely. And here's an example called virtual coworking. What it involves is working along team members on a video conference call, much like this one. So what you do is, whether it's fully virtual teams or hybrid teams on their non-office days, so the days they're not coming into the office, you'll sign into a one-hour video conference call and you start every, and this is for a six to eight people team or two, three, four people team. You just share the project on which you'll work. Start by sharing the project for 15 to 30 seconds. This is going to be maybe chat at the beginning, socialize, connect with each other, and share the project on which you'll work. This is not meant to be a collaborative activity. So you're not going to be talking to each other about the project. You'll not be working on the same project. You'll be working on your own projects. And so after you chat a little bit, socialize, connect, share the project, then you'll turn off your microphones. You want to leave your speakers on, and your video is going to be optional. If you just work on your own tasks, but when you have questions or innovation ideas or problems to solve, you turn on your microphone and you share your idea or ask questions or get problem solving from the group. Team members then brainstorm, discuss ideas and so on. And so then you end the episode and then you go on doing your own work. So I see often that team members, after they turn off their microphones, they work for five, 10 minutes, and then someone has a question, they turn on their microphones, they chat for a couple of minutes, maybe do screen sharing. Then they turn off their microphones, go on for another 10, 15 minutes. Somebody else has a question, they ask, they work on that. Maybe that's a longer conversation, five minutes. And then maybe another episode of that for an hour. And then it finishes. 
So you turn on the microphones and, and, and share what you accomplished. This is great for helping teams bond, for team collaboration. It also facilitates innovation because you get to brainstorm about ideas that people have. It's especially helpful for junior team members. It helps integrate them into a team, which is one of the bigger problems with hybrid work, but junior team members are not very well integrated into teams. And so this is really helpful for that problem. Mirta, I'm glad that you like the idea. Now, I'm curious for other folks, how valuable do you think it would be for you and your team members to integrate this virtual co-working into your place? Clearly Mirta thinks it would be valuable. What about everyone else? Please go ahead and vote. Five more seconds, make your voice heard. Excellent, so we see that the large majority, I mean, 90% of you would find it either highly or moderately valuable. So great, this is your opportunity to take it, this idea, and start integrating it. It's pretty easy, simple, try it out, practice, I'll send you some resources after the presentation to do so. Okay. And let's move on to solving a couple of more problems. Burnout and proximity bias and performance issues through a culture of excellence from anywhere. So proximity bias, you might have heard this term. It has to do with worries by people who are hybrid and remote about career advancement. That's one area of it. And another area of it is that there's envy by those who are in office for people who are hybrid and remote. That's another area's proximity bias. To address this, you really need to have a culture of excellence from anywhere. Focus on outputs and deliverables, not inputs, not where you work. There's a typical focus on inputs and where you work. There's management by walking around. That is not very helpful in a hybrid environment. You want to focus on outputs and deliverables. It helps address envy because it's not about location. It's about outcomes. It's about deliverables. It's about not about where you work, but just what you do. It helps address burnout because it focuses, again, on what you do, not how and where you do it. And it helps provide performance management with a focus on weekly goals through small-scale frequent evaluations. So what does that involve? Small-scale performance evaluations at weekly or bi-weekly or at monthly one-on-ones. Weekly tend to be ones with teams that are more closely collaborating with the team leader performing these meetings weekly one-on-one -on -one with, if they're going to be more, less, if more individual contributors, less collaboration than it might be bi-weekly. If it's more managers assessing other managers, it might be monthly or really independent um, people who are acting independently. So this is the you meeting with a manager, or if you are a manager meeting with your subordinates, weekly or bi-weekly or once a month for a one-on-one -on -one that has a performance evaluation element. Now, good managers already meet three week or two weeks with their subordinates, this just involves an additional element of performance management. That helps team members always know where they stand and gives them psychological safety, which we know improves retention and career growth. It prevents hybrid and remote workers from overworking and burning out due to feeling anxiety. And what it involves is team members and the supervisor agreeing on three to five weekly goals at their weekly one-on-one. -on -one. So you agree to three to five weekly goals, and then a team member sends the supervisor a report on accomplishing these three to five goals, the problems that they had and that they solved, and the self-evaluation 24 hours before the next one-on-one. -on -one. And the one-on-one, -on -one, the manager evaluates the performance of the team member, coaches them on solving problems, affirms or revises the evaluation, and sets goals for the next week. And so that's what the one-on-one -on -one involves. Again, it has a lot of benefits, it helps with improving career retention, career growth, prevents overworking and burning out. Very useful technique. Now, thinking about this technique, 
what do you think it would be, how useful would it be for you to integrate this technique with weak, this culture of excellence from anywhere to address proximity bias, burnout, including weekly performance evaluations? In the meantime, Elaine asks about virtual co-working. So yes, so Elaine, it's not meant for oh, virtual, it's not meant for collaborative projects. So it's not, meant, it's not meant for collaborative teamwork. It's meant for different projects. So it's going to be people advising each other and helping each other. So again, not meant for collaborative projects. So that's the point that you're working on your own individual tasks, but you learn from others who can give you advice on this. Okay, five more seconds for voting. Okay, again, we see very popular. So again, the large majority of you would see this as highly or moderately valuable, which is great. Again, this is an opportunity for you to go and integrate this technique to the extent that you have managerial responsibilities or suggest it to people in managerial roles. Excellent. Now, what is the actual impact of integrating these techniques? I'm going to share with you the words of Craig Knobloch. So Craig Knobloch is the executive director of the Information Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California, which is around the 400 people AI and other information sciences research institute, very hot topic as you can imagine. And he integrated these techniques and found them quite useful. So let's hear what Craig has to say about them. Uh, Lev Zabersky came, came to my attention sometime back during the pandemic when uh, I was planning to have our research institute uh, follow the standard path that all the big corporations are following. So Apple and Google were announcing plans to have people come back three days a week. So I thought that seems like a good plan. So we actually sent out a message said, Okay, starting this date, everyone's coming back three days a week, uh, and then you know can work from home two days a week. Uh, and and then I saw a video that Lev actually a video talk that Lev actually gave for IEEE uh, that really actually changed my mind about this. And it was a video about hybrid work and how important it was to actually embrace it. And uh, uh, and one of the things I was impressed in the video is that all these interesting ideas about how to make hybrid work more effective stuff. So I signed up for a meeting with Gleb and uh, uh, learned quite a bit more about you know, how to do hybrid work well. And so Gleb has come on as a consultant for the Information Science Institute and has been really helpful in terms of putting us much more in a leadership position in terms of figuring out how to do hybrid work. So we changed our policies. We are much more flexible about who can work at home and, and allowing people to work from home, you know, whatever makes sense with respect to their supervisor, uh, creating spaces in people's home offices, uh, figuring out how to onboard people in a way that, you know, when people haven't met in person, that is more effective. Uh, so I think he's been incredibly helpful in terms of really transitioning us to be a, sort of a lead in, in how we manage hybrid work at the, at the Institute. So it's been incredibly useful with all of Club's advice, and I appreciate all the help he's given us with respect to moving forward with this, our hybrid work plans. Okay, great. So let's now move on to the takeaways from the skin reflection on the future of work. So you want to integrate addressing decision-making cognitive biases into your culture to optimize outcomes on the future of work, despite personal discomfort that you might be experiencing. And Craig definitely experienced some personal discomfort as you could hear from the video in doing so. So you want to use a team-led hybrid first model with a minority fully remote to retain the best talent, improve productivity, and maximize well-being and address burnout. Adapt your culture to hybrid and remote work. You'll want to have training on effective hybrid work and virtual communication and collaboration, integrate virtual co-working for collaboration, team building, and integrating junior staff, and address proximity bias, burnout, and performance management through this excellence from anywhere culture and weekly performance evaluations. Now it's up to you. I want you to go out and help make this happen. And to close out, we'll do another brief poll. 
now that you've learned about this technique, how valuable do you think it would be to integrate this broader team-led approach into your workplace? Please go ahead and vote. So this broader team-led approach, including all of these elements. Great, five more seconds, make your voice heard. Go ahead and vote. Okay, so everyone will find it either highly valuable or moderately valuable, which is excellent. Delighted to hear that. I'm glad it was so helpful for you. Perfect. Okay, and then I'll be happy to provide some free resources after the event. So a copy of my best-selling book on leading hybrid team, hybrid and remote teams, and the free coaching session available for the first three claims. So there's gonna be some additional resources. I'm gonna run a poll on this, but you know, for those who are watching after the presentation, you won't be able to take a poll. It's going to be at tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. So if you're watching this after the presentation, go to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event to do to get the resources. And if you are attending right now, go ahead and vote at, in the poll. And I will be happy to take questions at this stage. I will share a reminder to everyone to go ahead and put any questions that you'd like to ask in the chat. Um, we've got one from Elaine that I'll that I'll be happy to share. Um, I also um, think that we have a small enough and a friendly enough group that if folks want to just raise your Zoom hand and ask your question yourself, that's also yeah. great. Um, yeah. But the, the question, is fine. yeah. So the question in the chat from Elaine was related to the um, the hybrid kind of virtual co working. And her question was that she sees the value when folks are collaborating on the same project, but could you share a little bit about how you see that working and how that would be beneficial um, if folks were perhaps on a team, but working on separate and different projects or work might still mm -hmm. be able to learn from each other? How might that function? Yeah, so um, to clarify, I think I mentioned this briefly, but so this is going. this is intended to be for different activities people on the same team, but who are doing different activities. So you're not collaborating during this time. You're not actively talking to each other. You're working on your individual tasks, but you're in the same team. So you're, you're aware of each other's work. And then if you have a question, you ask that with the assumption that perhaps some of your team members can help you work through it, talk through it. So you're exactly learning from each other. You're working on different activities, but you're learning from each other because you're part of the same team and you can give feedback on each other's work. I'm going to take facilitator privilege and ask a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. um, would you set some norms or agreements prior to about like quiet time versus question time or the manner in which one might seek feedback because different people's workflow might function differently? Like, do you chunk out the time periods? How would you structure that? No, just an hour and uh, then people would figure out their own norms and etiquette during this period and you what you want to do is you want to try it out a couple of times and then get after each time you want to get feedback from people and how it went and then you want to evolve it based on the feedback so just do a feedback survey after each time just an anonymous survey to everyone on suggestions and for improvement and then improve it based on then how it worked out but generally people figure it out and it works reasonably well remember this is a time meant for people chatting and asking questions if they need to. So people don't really spend this time on very focused work that they need to do. They spend on doing emails or doing whatever other things that they need to do that are not super focused. Great. Anton, am I, your, am I your mouthpiece or are you sharing your question? You've you got to mute yourself, I, I got it. I, got, I had to find my unmute button. I got almost no problem. Uh, Dr. Gleb, if you were sitting around and you'd had a couple glasses of scotch and somebody said to you, <laughs> um, 
what's the most difficult problem you've had to face mm. in trying to encourage people to engage in hybrid or remote work, or at least adopt a policy that uh, would make it possible in the organization? What would you say the most difficult mm. issue is that you had to face? Um, I think the most difficult issue I've had to face is getting leaders to trust their workers and to treat them like adults and to you know, just get the leaders to trust that their workers are going to do their work and to treat them not like kids, but like adults to see, okay, they're going to be responsible. They're going to do their work. We have certain measurements. We have certain evaluations. And if they don't do their work, then treat them like they don't do their work if, if, if they're in the office. So focus on the work that they do. Don't feel like you need to monitor them and micromanage them. You need to trust them while still holding them accountable, of course, through these small-scale performance evaluations. One of the big benefits of the small-scale performance evaluations is that you can quickly see whether people are actually getting their stuff done, which is definitely an area of anxiety for managers. But yes, trusting their team members, I think, is, has been the biggest issue I've seen and had to deal with. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And by the way, that resonates with me for a lot of reasons, but I mm. take the time here, but it's just, I agree with it. Mm. Thank you, Anton. Are there any other questions or There's examples? one by Laura Innes. Has, Laura has one in there. Yeah, it, that seemed more like a, a comment than a question to me, but... I don't know, Dr. Gleb, if you can co mm -hmm. comment a little bit on this idea that some of the trends and the the influence and the motivating factors for the insistence on, you know, the quote return to office is motivated by financial concerns about real estate and utilities more so than like the work outcomes. I've seen this be more the case for government entities um, or some nonprofits where the nonprofits want to justify having invested donor money into building a building and naming it after a donor. Um, not so much in companies, because companies are going to be happy to save some money. Oof. I haven't seen that be as much of a driver in companies. I've seen it be more in governments and nonprofits. Other folks, any other questions? The teacher in me wants to call on people individually. But <laughs> oh, Valerie, but I see I saw maybe, some people smile and now you're you're next. Valerie, maybe what we could do is let me perhaps just give a rundown of what we're going to be doing in, in the next few months and then come back and maybe someone will have a question by then. Would that be okay? And because I, I think I think Mirta Mirta has yeah. a question. Oh yes, good. just related to yes. contracts with government agents. Yeah, I do have contracts. In fact, I, I am working with a couple of I mean city departments, a couple of state departments, some I mean the University of Southern California, which I worked with was a government agency. I was recently approached by a couple of federal agencies that are right now figuring out their approach to office. And there are several um, state governments in Canada, so whatever they're called, the equivalent, the territory governments with which I'm working. Yes, so quite frequently, I have quite a lot of work with government agencies. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, Mirta. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and if, if Dr. Glebe, you can hang on with us just for three or four minutes. Sure. Let me just give folks an idea of what's going to happen in the next little bit uh, for us. And if anybody has other questions, uh, populate them here or just log on and ask. Uh, just want to let you know, on October 25th, we're going to have David Weil, professor at Brandeis University, who's going to talk on child labor. The title of the, the presentation is Child Labor Redo. Uh, why is it back? What can we do about it? Uh, I should tell you that Dr. Weil has, uh, is world-renowned in his work in this area. 
Uh, he's written a book that we've used at Penn State in some of our classes called The Fishered Workplace. Uh, we expect that to be another very informative evening. In January, the Lyra and the teaching section of Lyra will co-sponsor a, a presentation on developing AI policy. What is the process? This will include presenta presentations by university and business organizations. And then in February, we have Dr. Mark Anner, uh, who is Professor of Labor and Employment Relations and Center Director, Center for Global Worker Rights at Penn State. will talk on his research regarding collective bargaining and labor relations in Mexico. Those are all coming up. The dates for the January and February program will be listed very shortly. We will also be sending out a flyer next week on our meeting in October uh, with uh, Professor Wiley. Also, I'm going to stop talking in a second. I'm put an evaluation in the uh, chat pod. So before you leave tonight, if you'd fill that out, we'd appreciate it. But let me turn this back over to Valerie and Dr. Glee. I would be remiss if I did not remind everyone that if you are not yet a member of the Lyra, the time is now. Um, and I will be sure to share a link into the chat um, to allow you to do this. I am. Um, I only said it once tonight, friends, and I feel like that's growth on my part. Um, I, I have a question from Trisha here in the chat, um, and it's related to the like weekly evaluation mm -hmm. success process. Um, and so the question is that the, the process that you described and outlined um, sounds similar to what many folks are familiar with as performance improvement plans in many industries. And um, we're wondering if you can elaborate a little on how you see the differentiation between those two processes and maybe the value in terms of the time and what could feel like additional work invested in the process if one is making a weekly report um, in advance of a conversation. Sure. So the key here is that it's going to be on a weekly basis or a bi-weekly basis, rather than a once a month, once a year annual performance evaluation and improvement. This is something that I mentioned, you know, during the conversation, during the presentation. It helps address the coordination problems that naturally exists when people are working remotely. Much harder to get in touch with people leaders feel, and so they are worried about this lack of coordination. And therefore, they want to get people into the office because they feel, well, there's a lack of coordination. There another issue is the lack of trust. It's like, how do I trust that this person is actually working? And so to address the lack of trust. And it helps build a better relationship between people who are working in a hybrid modality part of the time remotely and the leader. So that helps improve retention and career growth. So there's a huge range of benefits that relates to retention, career growth, trust, coordination, actually making sure that people are doing what they're doing. So this is an invaluable technique, very, very useful. Great, thanks. And we have another question from Roan in the, in the chat there. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see significant differences in conducting performance evaluations for the hybrid workers as opposed to full-time um, office workers? So I'm imagining that's both in terms of process and outcome. So my, the main difference is that you solve a lot of coordination problems. That's kind of a big, big challenge. So as I mentioned, coordination is a big issue and trust is a big issue. So you're solving those issues which exist on a lesser, to a lesser extent for in office workers where managers can do the traditional thing and just manage by walking around. So that's kind of the, all of those areas that are solutions to the problems that, I mean, that are naturally encountered with hybrid work in the remote. You're welcome, Brown. If you have... don't mind, uh, sorry, this is Dwayne. Hello to everybody, Dr. Glove. Thank you. I'm driving on my hour sure. and a half commute home. So uh, <laughs> my, one, my one question for you is, I deal with a lot of multinational teams uh, and mm -hmm. a lot of virtual work that in teams making things happen. How do you deal with the multinational tempo? For example, I'm currently working with teams in Ukraine, UAE, mm -hmm. and Chile trying to do collaborative work. And as you know, each one of those cultures approach to work is completely different. How do you work on, uh, how do you think 
or solve the problem of cultural tempo in multinational virtual teams? That's a difficult issue when you're working with multinational teams. And there's, so I'll send you, so everyone, if you type up that you want to get resources from my book, I'll send you the book. And the book talks much more about setting expectations because there's a lot of differences in communication styles and including tempo of how do you communicate, which channels, how often, what's the response requested, which time zones do you work and all that. So you need to create what's called team level guidelines or team level agreements that get people coordinated across your team. And that's a very important technique that is definitely going to be valuable for you to think about and set the team level agreement to create a common shared norm across all the different norms of all the folks that you're working with. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. Any other questions, folks? We have a couple minutes um, under the heading of I've never had an unexpressed thought. Um, uh, let me, since we have a couple minutes, make a point, I think, about something mm -hmm. you said that I said resonated with me and mm -hmm. the notion of trusting people. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember years ago, this is 35 years ago, I was working with a nursing home and mm -hmm. the manager couldn't get people to come to work on holidays. It was a small nursing home couldn't get people to show up. He'd give mm -hmm. a schedule. He thought he figured everything out, give a schedule, and people would just call in sick on Thanksgiving, call in sick on Christmas, call in sick on New Year's. So what, I used to tease him all the time about it because he would end up working those days. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, uh, one year I, I was working and I said, how'd it go this year? Thinking he's going to give me a sob story. He said, well, perfectly. I said, what happened? He said, I said to the employees, I need four people on duty at this time for the three years. I said, you guys figure out who can be here, who can't be here. Just, I just need you to show up. You guys make the decision. And mm -hmm. never had a problem after that. I mean, he had mm -hmm. to trust them and mm -hmm. he did. And it, it taught me something in terms of how I should manage and work with people. I mean, if you can't yeah. trust them, you might as well, you know, lock them up in the office. So <laughs> but, uh, your point uh, really hit the mark. Good work. Mm, excellent. Excellent. That's a great story, Anton. Okay. On that note, thank you everyone for coming. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good work. Thank you all. Good work. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank thank you, you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Sure.